Boston there. Everyone kind of knew me. If you've ever been to Boston, they named a bridge after me. People say, are you related to the Tobin Bridge? I'm not related to the Tobin Bridge, but everybody thought I was related to the Tobin Bridge. So I didn't have to pay 25 cents when I went over it to splash my name. But what I learned at Boston University is the importance of starting fresh every year. Because one of my professors, my thesis advisor, said to me, he said, Bob, if you want to be a professor, don't be a boring professor. There's none like that in Keio, but at Boston University there were some. They said, don't be a boring professor, be an exciting professor. He said, every year at the end of the year, take your notes and rip them up. I said, oh no, I did all this junbi, I did all this preparation, how can I rip them up? He said, no, start fresh every year. And some students have taken my class for four years, and I think, I won't point them out in this class, but I think I have started fresh every single year. The other thing that I remember at Boston University is that I was in the business school and I studied organizational behavior. And organizational behavior is very briefly, it's psychology, it's sociology, and it's business, and it's all mixed. And it gave me a very, very broad view of the world when I studied organizational behavior. I got to see so much and do so many kinds of things. But one day I walked into a class that I thought was going to be a management class, and when I walked in there, there was the accounting professor. I go, what? I signed up for a management class. What's the accounting professor doing here? And the accounting professor said, no, I'm going to teach the class in management. He, think, he said to me, you think just because I'm an accounting professor, I don't know anything about management? I said, no, it's not your Simon. It's not your specialty. He said, no, I know a lot about management. And he taught about management, and it was a great class. And I learned that it was really important to get out of your comfort zone and sometimes teach about something that you know that's not your specialty, but you still know something about. Today, my dentist is here. Today, people I've known for a very, very long time. But they're not here just because they're the dentist. Some of my colleagues are here very much from the beginning when I first came to Kale. They are people who have a wide variety of interests. And I encourage you, please don't think you have one job. You have many kinds of jobs. There are many things that you can do. You're a mother, you're a housewife, you're an accountant, you're a management professor, you're a fashionista, whatever you are. You have many different identities. And please try to do what you can do to embrace them. This was my motto. No one discovered new lands by standing on the shore. And if you really want to go somewhere, get out of your comfort zone, you're really going to go someplace different. This happens to be a French philosopher, but I think many people can say it even more eloquently. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of Facebook and get into your face. You know, do something different. You know, I'm leaving KO. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it's really, really important for everyone to try something different, to try something fresh. And for me, I went out to California after living in Boston, and I taught in a couple of universities. And I really enjoyed California. I had a wonderful life. If you can imagine, I did triathlons in California. I used to go every morning swimming in the ocean because the ocean was only three thousands away from my, from my house. I had clients that were primarily military clients, but you know, I enjoyed the teaching. I was teaching MBA students. I was teaching undergraduate business students. I was teaching communication. And it was a really, really good life. And I taught at Pepperdine University. And if any of you have ever been there, it overlooks the ocean. So I'd be teaching my class. The kids would be there with their surfboards. They want to go surfing. So I really had to be a good teacher to keep them there and not, you know, not have them go into the ocean. But I enjoyed that job very much. But then something happened. The dean knocks on my door. Yes? Do you want to go to Japan? Now, this was 23 years ago. I said, Japan, it's so far. <laughs> I don't want to go to Japan. And then, do you want to go to Japan? No way. Give up my wonderful California life. I can't do it. But you know, in Japan, in any country, when they knock three times, and I said this to Professor Yukawa when I came here, when they knock three times, it's time to come. It's time to go. It's time to do something different. So I came to Japan. I actually came to Japan with the US military. Some people think that took courage on my part. 
I worked on the base helping military commanders downsize the military. So I was a professor for a university called Chapman University, and I would go from base to base helping people figure out what they wanted to do with their life once they left the military. I didn't teach them how to use weapons, so get that out of your mind. But I was there at a very, very interesting time, a time when the military was downsizing. And I went everywhere. I went to Korea. I went to the Philippines. I went to Hong Kong. I had never, ever been on a military base in my life. I went to Japan, and I loved it right from the beginning. That is the honest truth. And I didn't even know how to say konnichiwa. And all of the people that I worked with were people who were from the military base. So I didn't meet a lot of Japanese people. But I started meeting Japanese people, and I started getting off the base a little bit. And that job was a job you had for a one-year contract. And for one year, I went all around the world, two months in a different base. And if you talk about culture shock, that was culture shock. Every two months, I had to go someplace different. I had to figure out a way to do my job well. And then as soon as I knew how to do my job well, I had to go to the next place. So I came to Japan. I really loved it. And I called up my boss, and I said, hey, I really like Japan. Can I stay here on Yokosuka? And I had a very, very small apartment. But to me, it was heaven. It was working. It was on the military base. It was this big. The guy who was there before me must have really loved Japan because he left natto in the refrigerator. <laughs> and I didn't even know what it was. I was afraid to even look at it. But he left, he left, a, he left a lot of natto in the, uh, in the refrigerator. But it was a very, very small apartment. I was very, very happy to have that place. I said, can I stay here two months longer, and four months longer, and six months longer? And then I said, can I stay two months longer? And they said to me, oh, no, no, you have to go to Korea. And I had been to Korea. He said, OK, if you don't go to Korea, how about the Philippines? I said, no, I want to stay in Japan. So I said, OK, I'll do this job for two more months. And I went to the airport to get on the plane. And when I got on the plane, the stewardess, and the stewardess in the military isn't beautiful. The stewardess in the beautiful, the stewardess in the military is like this. Hey, mister, I'm sorry. Your orders have been canceled. You can't go to Korea. You have to stay in Japan two more months. Oh, man, I had to cry, right? I had to fake it. But I got to stay in Japan two more months. And I decided I was going to quit my job and see what I could do in Japan. Here I was, 42 years old, 43 years old. I had no idea what I could do in Japan, but I just quit my job. At the end of the two months, I just quit. I said, I can't go back to America. After you've been to Japan, sorry, Americans. <laughs> Why would you ever leave this place? This is heaven. This is heaven. Every day, heaven. Do you think for a minute I would want, and California was heaven too, but this is better heaven. I said, no, I think I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go back. I'm going to quit my job. I had no job. I was living with my partner in a six-mat room. The two of us living in a six-mat room, I said, that's it. I'm going to quit my job. And they said, you're going to lose your retirement. I had a house in California. I had a car in California, everything. Eventually, I sold everything. But here I was, 42, 43 years old, like this, living in a six-mat room, calling up English schools every day. Do you need a teacher? Do you need a teacher? Help me find a job. I didn't have any. Don't tell immigration this. I didn't have a visa either. <laughs> All right? The visa that I had was from the military. So I had no visa. Here I was. I was kind of naked. All right? All I had was my brain. And I'm telling you, it's not because it's my brain. That's enough. You have your skill. You have your knowledge. You have your brain. You have your personhood. It's enough. It's enough. You don't need a Hanko. You don't need a Keo. You don't need a Stanford. You don't need a Harvard. What you need is inside of you. That's the most important thing. And the way it was for me is I was there with no job, calling up English schools. And then finally, I said, Oh, I could have do something like this because hello, how are you is getting a little bit boring for me. But English teaching was very interesting for me. It was very interesting because I got insight into people. 
and I got insight into Japan. So I made the most of it. I figured out some way to make it work for me. But eventually, I got some consulting work with Japanese companies. And the Japanese companies that I got consulting work were any company that began with an N was my client. NEC, NKK, NHK, NTT, Nippon Steel, because Japanese companies were expanding in America at that time. And they needed somebody who knew about America. And they said, Bob, maybe you know something about America. And maybe you can help us expand in America. So these companies hired me to help them learn about American business practices. So it was a really nice fit for me. But I'm telling you, I lived in a six-mat room in Moto Sumiyoshi. And these companies, they expected some fancy consultant. So I did wear a suit, of course. And every morning, a limousine would come up to my small apartment in Moto Sumiyoshi. And the guy would be looking around, you know, where does this guy live? Where, did, where is this place? And then I'd walk downstairs. The guy would run to open the door and then take me to deliver these seminars and then deposit me at the end of the night. Well, it sounds like it was heaven, but I wanted to teach. I mean, that's what I went to graduate school. That was the fire that was burning inside of me. That's what I wanted to do. I got my PhD and I said, I want to teach. I want to work with young people. It's more fun. So, sorry, adults, but you can imagine. What? It's more fun to work with young people. Sometimes people say to me, Bob, isn't consulting more exciting? No, sorry to any of my clients who are here. No, it's, much, it's so much fun to work with young people. It's exciting. And I think some of the people that I know who have also worked with young people, they know how exciting it can be. So I wanted to teach. I was living in Moto Somiyoshi, And I heard that there was a university. I didn't really know the name. Kayo, Keo, Kyo. I'm not sure what it was. But my partner said to me, he said, you know, there's a university there, but they'll never hire you. I said, really? He said, no, it's one of the top universities in the world. It's a great university. I said, well, how about me? And he said, well, maybe you can do it. So I applied for a job, and they hired me to teach out in Fujisawa. And for six months, I taught in Fujisawa. And then after teaching in Fujisawa, I heard about Shogakubu. And I heard that Shogaku, I said, boy, that might be a good fit for me. I know something about business. I know something about communication. I was a business major in college. Maybe that will be good for me. So I got a connection. And you needed a connection at that time. So I got a connection. And the connection said, yeah, they're looking for somebody in Shogakubu. Maybe you're the right fit. And they hired me. I had been a full professor before. And they hired me as Hijokin, which is a part-time teacher. I didn't care. They could have hired me to sweep the floors. I was so happy. And I see some smiling faces here, which were some of the same people that I met when I first came here. So they hired me as a hijokin. And then one day, somebody came and they said, you know, we're going to have an opening for a homonkoshi, for a visiting professor. And maybe you can apply for that. And I applied for that, and I didn't get it. Some other guy got it. <sighs> I was sad. I was sad. I was disappointed. And you know what happened? I was so lucky the other guy didn't take the job. The other guy didn't take the job. Mr. Narse, who's not here today, he called me up for 15 days until I, he could reach me. There was no answering I think in those days, no answering machine. <laughs> there were certainly no computers. And he called me up and he said, Dr. Tobin, we have a job for you. You can come and be homonkoshi in Keio, in Shogakubu. Will you take it? And of course, it took me only a minute for me to say yes. And then a couple of years later, it turns out that there was a job for a full-time professor in Keio University. And I came to Keio University and to Shogakubu as the first full-time Gaijin professor. It's true. <laughs> 